All right, hello everyone, and welcome to my channel. We do educational videos on this channel, and um, we usually look at great theories of everything, and um, you know, try to encourage holistic thinking and paradigm shifting, and. Awakening to 5D Consciousness and uh, the cosmologies, the theories of everything we look at are, uh, you know, presented in order to facilitate uh, those things. And today is our 568th video on the Reciprocal System of Theory. From Dewey B. Larson and Associates. And uh, Mr. Larson was an American engineer who lived in the 20th century. He died back in 1990. Left behind a lot of great books. Um, books on physics and chemistry, astrophysics, astronomy. His final book is on metaphysics, which includes sections on philosophy, religion, psychology, biology, and um, he also has two books on economics, and we are looking at one of those books today called The Road to Permanent Prosperity, and um, we'll get into that in just a minute, but uh, let me just tell you a little bit about Larson's theory. Larson is one of the only uh, cosmologists or scientists who proposed a universe based upon motion. Not matter, not energy, but the universe is made entirely of motion. And that motion exists in three dimensions, in discrete units, and it exists with two reciprocal aspects, space and time. Space and time have no independent existence. They only exist together in motion. I was running at 10 miles an hour, 10 miles of space in one hour of time, space over time. Speed is space over time. But Larson spreads that out to all of our scientific quantities like matter, energy, force, pressure. These are all fractions with space or time as the numerator and time or space as the denominator. But you can have time or space in multiple exponents. You can have uh, time over space to the second power. That would be force. You can have space over time to the second power. That is acceleration. You can have Time over space is energy. Time over space to the fourth power is pressure. Time to the third power over space to the third power is matter. Time to the uh, space to the third power over time is electrical capacitance. And so on and so forth. And uh, Larson and... Um, takes that uh, postulate about motion, three dimensions, and discrete units. In particular, he's talking about what he calls scalar motion. Scalar motion is a motion that has a magnitude, but it has no specific direction. So this is kind of a more generalized or generic form of motion. Um, it uh, can be visualized using a balloon that you put dots on. And as you blow up the balloon, all of the dots will be moving away from each other. Uh, they won't be moving in any specific direction. Every dot will be moving away from every other dot. So every dot will be moving in every direction. But they will all be moving outward. If you contract the balloon, 
um, they will still not be moving in any specific direction, but they will be moving inward. So the only direction you have in scalar motion is inward or outward. This is a, a motion that's really inherent. Um, and that outward motion is always present in Larson's universe. This is what he calls the progression. And when it occurs at the rate of one unit of space per one unit of time, he calls that the progression of the natural reference system. This is the uh, omnipresent, uh, eternal uh, motion of the universe. And it feels like absolutely nothing. And um, when we reverse it, uh, then it can turn into mani manifestation. Um, so, it must be reversed in three dimensions um, to kind of turn that outward motion of that balloon to an inward motion. That outward motion Larson calls the progression, the inward motion he calls the gravitation. And um, manifestation occurs by reversing the progression in three dimensions and uh, you know Larson writes up his periodic table uh, accordingly now when uh, if you'd like to get a more detailed analysis of the um, importance and ramifications of the reciprocal system watch some of my first 474 videos on the subject and um, but uh, today we're looking at how this applies to economics. Um, now, when Larson goes into economics, he goes into it as a scientist and recognizes that the economic system is also a system in motion and that it uh, requires a scientific approach. Um, most economists are of the sociological school where they have certain preferences uh, according to their political bent, and uh, they attempt to impose those things, whether it's Marxism or free marketism or whatever it is. And um, they uh, are missing the point because the economic system is not... Uh, I think as Larson says right here in this chapter 19 that we uh, almost finished yesterday, it, that, um, it, you know, you can, um, you, you can uh, apply these so sociological approaches as much as you like, um, but if they're not in harmony with the laws of physics, then your economic system is going to collapse. And um, Larson points out that most of the, you know, sociological approach to economics is an approach that is a, an attempt to get something for nothing. And um, that goes against the iron law of economics, which is work or starve. You have to produce something in order to get something. And... Um, those are the two reciprocal aspects of uh, economics, production and consumption. And he goes from there and arrives at a number of different principles of economics. Anyway, um, if you'd like to start this book right at the front, uh, chapter one, go back about six weeks in the archives and start from there. But we are in chapter 19 of this book right now, uh, just about to finish chapter 19 and move into chapter 20. Chapter 19 is called Who Reaps the Harvest? And it really talks about how, uh, in spite of what the Marxists say, that uh, the capitalists are trying to gouge the, um, the workers into uh, accepting absolute subsistence. Uh, wages, that that makes no sense, and that uh, basically labor 
is competing with labor and capital is competing with capital not capital is not competing with labor and those two things are independent of each other and um, so we're going to just uh, read the last final paragraph here of chapter 19 and then move into chapter 20, which I believe is on price controls, or let's see, uh, chapter 20 is on economic controls. Okay, so let's finish here, chapter 19. The rejection of the findings of Walker and his scientific contemporaries by the sociologically oriented economists who have dominated the economic profession in later years has cost the nation dearly, but we can prevent further losses of this kind by adopting a policy of basing economic actions on solid facts and sound theory rather than on emotional grounds. When the economists, the, the governmental authorities, and the nation as a whole finally arrive at a realization that they must take economic laws and principles just as they are, whether they approve or disapprove of them, as they know they must do in the case of physical laws and principles, the door will be opened to the solution of most of our major economic problems. Okay, so that's kind of uh, a summary uh, of what I was just saying there that, um, you know, uh, scientists don't, you know, they don't complain about the law of conservation of motion or they don't complain about friction. They work around it. They work with it because they know that these are laws and they cannot be avoided, you know, um, but economists try to resist the inevitable um, through their soci sociological approach. They, th they think that uh, a lot of times this does happen, uh, particularly, you know, in spiritual world with the law of karma and so on. Um, people th think that, uh, yeah, well, um, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And that is a, a law, a physical law, Newton's third law. Um, but somehow people think that it doesn't apply to humans. You know, it doesn't apply to human actions. Um, those things are, you know, governed by God or something like that. Um, not saying that there's no God, but just saying that... Um, you know, humans are also subject to the law of, um, you know, what comes around goes around. And um, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And just because they, you know, believe in Jesus or, you know, believe in Allah, it doesn't mean that they are now, um, you know, not subject to the law of Newton's third law. Anyway, moving on, chapter 20. This chapter is called Economic Controls. As stated in chapter 3, the aims of economic science are to, to determine how the American individual enterprise economic system operates and how it can be manipulated to accomplish the economic objectives defined by the appropriate agencies of society. The preceding chapters have described the operation of the economy as seen in the light of the information derived from a systematic analysis and have identified the economic quantities that can theoretically be modified by external influences. In preparation for a discussion of the various practical ways of exercising control over the operation of the economy, this chapter will recapitulate the control points that have been identified and will describe the nature of the controls that can be exercised at each of these points. With the benefit of the analysis in the preceding chapters, we are now able to explain why 
as the economists themselves admit in the statements quoted in the earlier pages. Economic theory has not been able to point the way to a solution of the most important economic problems of our time. This analysis shows that the economists have not ascertained how the economic me mechanism actually operates and therefore have not been able to identify the points at which it can be effectively controlled. As a result, their efforts to remedy economic ills have consisted mainly of substituting arbitrary actions for certain features of the normal operation of the system. Some of these attempt to do the impossible direct control of the price level, for example. Others, such as creation of new jobs, are promptly counterbalanced by the operation of natural forces. And still of others, of which disastrous policy of, uh, of which the disastrous policy of controlling inflation by choking business activity is the prime example, apply cures that are worse than the original disease. That sounds familiar, cures that are worse than the original disease. Uh, Larson was writing this way back in the 1970s and 80s. The detailed study of the operation of the economic system in its true status as a continuous flow process clearly indicates that the optimum production of values results if the mechanism is allowed to operate without interference. This is not an argument in favor of laissez-faire economics. The economic system is not a self-sufficient mechanism. There are certain points at which decisions must be made and imposed on the system. There are other points at which arbitrary modifications may be made if the authorities in charge of the economy so desire. And both the operation of the system and the results that are obtained from it may be modified substantially by actions that are taken after the economic mechanism has completed its task chiefly those taken in connection with the distribution of the products of economic activities. Determination of the volume of production and employment within the limits of the capacity of the economy is purely a matter of decision by individuals or agencies, public or private, as the case may be. These decisions may be influenced by economic actions of various kinds. And in some cases, the effect of a particular influence is quite predictable. But there is no direct connection between any specific action, such as an action to increase demand, and the effect on production. The employment analysis in um, The Road to Full Employment which is Larson's other book on economics, The Road to Full Employment, uh, demonstrated that actions taken to increase employment, as well as those that have an unintended effect on employment, exert their effect through the changes that they produce in an economic function that was called the survival limit. In that work. In order to understand the nature of this limit, it should be realized that the American economic system and the others that operate on a private enterprise basis are competitive systems. The criterion of performance in such a system is profitability, which measures the results of the operation of the individual firms or production units in terms of the values produced relative to the amounts of labor and capital services utilized. Within a certain range defined by the average production costs, 
the effective values depend on the competitive situation, not on the productivity of the individual enterprise relative to any absolute standard. This means that in order to avoid an operating loss, which few firms can stand for more than a limited period of time, the productivity of each individual enterprise must exceed a certain percentage of the average productivity of the economy as a whole. That percentage is the survival limit. Firms whose productivity drops below the limit cannot long survive. To illustrate the effect of the limit, let us consider what would happen if we set it at 100% of the average. That is, we required each enterprise to exceed the average productivity in order to be allowed to continue operation. Obviously, enough of these firms would have to go out of business to account for half of the employment. Of course, we would try to replace the failures with new and more efficient enterprises, but this would not change the situation. Since the standard is an average, no matter how efficient the new firms may be, half of the new total would still find themselves below the survival limit. What has not been appreciated heretofore, at least in connection with the employment situation, is that in a competitive economy, this same principle applies wherever the survival limit is set. A limit below 100% of the average results in a lower percentage of business failures and consequently a lower rate of unemployment, but it does not eliminate the adverse effect. If the survival limit remains at the level that produces 5% unemployment under the conditions currently prevailing, there will continue to be 5% unemployment indefinitely, regardless of how many new enterprises begin operation and how many new jobs are created. This is one of the many places where economic quantities are in a state of equilibrium and therefore and are therefore subject to the natural laws governing equilibrium systems particularly le chatelier's principle which states that disturbing an equilibrium in one direction or the other generates forces that tend to restore the original condition in the case cited in the preceding paragraph Stimulation of business activity by means of subsidies or similar devices may have resulted in addition of X new jobs. But the operation of Le Chatelier's principle will restore the equilibrium condition by causing failures or curtailments that eliminate X previously existing jobs. Or... If all unemployment were eliminated by withdrawing the currently unemployed from the ranks of those seeking work, the operation of that principle would ensure that enough firms would cease or curtail operation to bring the unemployment back up to the equilibrium rate, 5% in the example discussed. As brought out in The Road to Full Employment, where those issues were discussed in detail. What this means is that a quasi-permanent increase in employment can be achieved only by some measure or measures that lower the survival limit. The position of that limit depends on the ratio of the irreducible components of production costs to the total cost. Taxes, other than those on income, are fixed, as is interest. Labor is generally the largest item in the production cost, and under present conditions, it is very difficult to reduce the wage and salary rates. 
The reductions that are made in the outlay for labor are therefore usually limited to what can be done in the way of reducing the working force. Aside from this limited reduction in the labor cost and a few miscellaneous savings, the only cost items that can be eliminated to meet a financial emergency are profits and income taxes. In recent years, the wage structure has become more rigid and new taxes have been added. As a result, the survival limit has been increasing. The effect on employment has been tragic. As late as 1960, the report of the President's Commission on National Goals was able to take 4% as the normal unemployment rate. In practice, it asserted, we must seek to keep unemployment consistently below 4% of the labor force. 25 years later, Samuelson and Nordhaus estimate the natural rate of unemployment at 6%. The difference is an indication of the extent to which the employment situation has deteriorated in the intervening quarter of a century. The dependence on the rate of employment on the survival limit explains how inflation affects the employment situation. Um, let me read that sentence again. The dependence of the rate of, employ of unemployment the dependence of the rate of unemployment on the survival limit explains how inflation affects the employment situation. As brought out in the previous discussion, cost inflation due to increases in money wages has no effect on the general operation of the economic system and therefore no effect on the survival limit. These increases in money wages do not increase real wages. But if the cost inflation is due to higher business taxes, it is one of the factors which, along with decreased flexibility of the wage structure, tends to increase the normal level of the survival limit and the corresponding level of unemployment. The level which is now estimated at about 6%. Money inflation has a greater and more direct effect. As we saw in chapter 12, it increases the profitability of productive operations. The higher profits reduce the ratio of irreducible costs to total costs. Employment consequently increases. During one period following World War II, economists noted a fairly constant relation between the amount of inflation and the unemployment rate, which received widespread attention under the name Phillips Curve. Belief in the existence of a stable relation of this nature has dwindled in more recent years, particularly since the coexistence of high inflation and high Unemployment has become so common that the term stagflation has been coined to describe it. But most of the economic profession still holds to the belief that there is a trade-off between inflation and unemployment, so that if we want to cure or ameliorate one of, the, one of these economic ills, we must accept at least some of the other. The finding that there is no direct connection between inflation and, uh, and employment changes this, uh, this picture drastically. Most cost inflation has no effect at all on employment, since the usual cause of that form of inflation, arbitrary wage increases, changes only the money labels, not the real economic quantities. Money inflation does does alter the survival limit, and through it, the rate of unemployment. But the present study has revealed that inflation is only one of many influences that have the same effect. Full employment without inflation is therefore not an impossible goal, as most economic uh, economists now contend, but can be reached 
by using some selection from among the various non-inflationary means of reducing the survival limits. A discussion of the measures that are available for this purpose is included in the Road to Full Employment. Another point at which a decision must be made and imposed on the economic system is the establishment of the money wage level and, as a consequence, the market price level. There is no way by which the economic system itself can set the thermostat. As brought out earlier, what this setting accomplishes is to fix the relation between money and goods at some arbitrary level. In addition to these points at which outside control must be exercised, there are other points where it is optional. Here the free operation of the economic system would produce certain results, but all or part of the control may be assumed by governmental or other agencies. The composition of the products of the economy is one of these optional items. If the system is allowed to operate without outside interference, it will produce that mixture of goods which has the highest total value as determined by the consumer's preferences. Almost always, however, the community as a whole, acting through government agencies, modifies this composition by restricting or prohibiting the production of some items and requiring the production of others. The range of action of this nature extends all the way from merely regulating the production of certain items, addictive drugs, for example, to comp comprehensive planning in which an attempt is made to predetermine the entire output of the economy. The extent to which authoritarian control should be substituted for the automatic operation of the economic system is a matter of opinion or judgment and therefore outside the scope of economic science. Okay, uh, we're going to stop right there and uh, we will resume this chapter uh, when we resume tomorrow. So, um, thanks for tuning in today, and have a wonderful day.